Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, change tack a little bit here and take a somewhat practical view about what publishers can do together with Crossref to increase trust in both your content um, and in publishing practices. So I'm not going to explain who Crossref is, what we are. I think probably everyone here knows that. But I want to show you the slide um, because we are changing the way we talk about ourselves a little bit. We've got a completely new look, which we really like. We unveiled that at our annual meeting in Boston a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're trying to simplify our message. Crossref does a lot of things. We're involved in a lot of things. Um, and over the past few years, some of our products and services have become a little bit detached from our parent brand. So we are... Uh, um, working to bring it all back together and kind of unify things a little bit. But anyway, new look, really excited about it, struggling to drop the capital R in the middle of Crossref when we type, but that's, that's the way we're going. So at Crossref, we do think of ourselves very much as part of the infrastructure of scholarly communication. Crossref's been running in the background for 15 years now, um, making sure that scholarly publications are linked up and citable. And I said in my abstract that we're not just about DOIs these days, but everything that we've done in the last five to ten years pretty much runs off the same thing. And that's the DOI metadata. So Crossref's all about metadata. Publishers metadata and all of our services are either about metadata coming into Crossref or metadata going out, ingesting and disseminating metadata, if you like. So the metadata provides the foundations for everything that we do. And that makes it really quite important, and that's the subject of my talk today. I'm going to talk about how depositing good quality in rich metadata with Crossref allows not only us to build tools, but it also provides the building blocks for others in the community, including our members, to also build new things. So the metadata, first of all, it makes DOI links work. And obviously, when we're talking about readers and researchers trusting your content, being able to persistently locate it and cite it is fairly fundamental. That's why Crossref was started. That's still the main use case for why publishers join us today. We've got this huge linking network, and we can reassure researchers that their work won't vanish, the URL will keep working, so on and so forth. And it's also the means by which you can follow citations in work when you're checking that things have been credited properly. So, as I say, this still remains the main thing about cross, Crossref and the DOI. But I want to move beyond that and talk a little bit about additional metadata. Um, other metadata that publishers can and should be depositing with us that will help to increase this trust in what you're publishing. So these are the questions I want to look at today. Um, so I'm taking this from the perspective of the reader or the researcher coming to the content that you publish. So I've got an article in front of me. I want to know who wrote it, who contributed to the research that I'm reading about here. What else do we know about them? What else have they written? What has this particular author or set of authors also been doing? Is it original? That's a fairly um, fundamental question when we're talking about ethics. Has anything happened to this article since it's been published? Have there been corrections applied? Has it been retracted? That's a very important thing to know. Has it been peer reviewed? And if so, how? What can I do with it? Or conversely, what should I not do with this piece of content? So getting the correct answers to all of these questions helps the reader to trust what they're reading and to trust where it's being published. And these are all questions that can be answered by the metadata that you have for a piece of content. This is all information that you know as publishers. You have all this information there. Um, and what I really want to say is that getting this metadata out there, making it as visible and easily accessible as possible, can only be a really good thing. So let's start with who is involved in the research. And I've got a couple of points to make here, but the first one is identifying authors correctly. I really touched on this this morning. Author names have always been part of the standard metadata that publishers supply to Crossref, but we are asking you now to go a step further with identification and disambiguation. And of course, I'm talking about ORCID, um, unique identifiers for researchers or contributors, as they're called in the acronym. How many here have got an ORCID ID? Yay, way, way more than half, excellent. Um, this is mine up on the screen. So it distinguishes you from other researchers with the same name. It's being used in an increasing number of places now. I know a lot of universities are using it in their systems. Publisher submission systems, I think most of them have at least the option for you to um, log in and work through the process using your ORCID. And the message from Crossref is if you are collecting ORCIDs in any of your publishing processes, push them right through to the metadata and send them to us too, because it makes a huge difference. 
If we can tie everything up, it makes things much clearer. So if you've got a paper in front of you from author A, and you want to know what else they've written, you might be able to find them out there, the articles, if you can be sure that it's the same author that you're actually looking up. Whereas if Crossref has the DOI and the ORCID tied together, then you can be absolutely sure that that author wrote those additional papers. And I'm talking slightly abstractly about the metadata here, but to give you an example of, um, I'll skip through that, of how you could do that. This is our own search interface, Crossref Search. Um, you can enter an ORCID into this, and it will bring you back all of the works that that author has contributed to. Um, everything that you see in our search interfaces here is also available through our API, which is freely available for anyone to use. Um, so a machine interface, anyone can query that. Um, so there are lots and lots of applications um, and ways in which people can get at this data to find out things that they might not have been able to find out before. The other thing I would say about this is that we don't have all that many orchids in the system at the moment, but as it grows, um, this kind of search will be a really helpful resource for checking things like duplicate submissions or self-plagiarism, if you can easily just pull up a complete list of anything that um, a particular author has contributed to. This is, you can do the same thing on the orchid site. Um, if you just go and do a search on orchid, if the author's chosen to share the information, you can find out other works, you can find their affiliations past and present, the grants they've received and their education history, a whole load of information if they've um, populated those fields. So we have got about 200,000 articles in the Crossref database that have ORCIDs now. Um, that's still a tiny fraction of the 78 million DOIs we've got. So we do ask publishers, please, if you're collecting this, send ORCIDs as part of your metadata. It really helps to enrich that um, and to make a lot of things a lot more visible, a lot of relationships a lot more visible. So before I move on from author identification, I want to mention this project that some of you might be aware of. It's the Credit Taxonomy, which is the Contributor Role Taxonomy, um, which has been developed to give some more insight into the particular roles that each author's played in a piece of research. Um, we saw some examples this morning of papers that have got hundreds, if not thousands, of authors. Um, and I think this is aiming to provide some clarity into situations like that. So um, it was developed by a group of publishers and funders, I think. It's now maintained by Kazrai. One of the first implementations, or at least that I've seen, is on the Biomed Central Journal Giga, Giga Science, which is what I've got the screenshot from here. Um, I don't think you'll be able to read the text on there, but what it is is that authors can um, identify themselves as having had one or more of 14 different roles in the research, and they vary from conceptualization, data curation, project management, writing, reviewing the writing, all the different roles. And of course, an author can have more than one role within that. Um, but it does put some really good visibility on exactly what each person did. And I would imagine that then, particularly if issues come up later, the accountability may become a little bit clearer if you know who did what in the process. This is one piece of metadata we're not collecting at Crossref at the moment, actually. Um, but it's very much on our radar, and I think that we will, it won't be long before we start to do that and tie it into probably our Crossmark product, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So in terms of contribution, it's not just the authors. You need to know who funded the research. That's um, an important piece of background knowledge. That's all information that's in acknowledgement sections, always has been. That's absolutely fine. But it's kind of buried in the full text. Um, and the way that it's always traditionally been done, it's very hard to look at it across publications, to search on it, to mine for it, to look at it in any kind of larger way. So for the last two years, Crossref has been asking publishers to extract that information from the acknowledgements, tidy it up a bit, and deposit this as Crossref metadata as well, funding data. You may have heard of this project known as Fundref. That's one of the ones we're changing the name from. We're stopping, to call, stopping calling everything something ref. It's getting a bit out of hand. Um, but the funding data project um, works on the back of a list of funder names, a list of standardized funder names. We have a file now that contains 11,000 international fund funding bodies. And we're asking publishers to match the funders in the acknowledgement sections to those standardized names in our registry of funders. Or you can ask, the publishers can ask the authors to pick from that list of names when they're submitting their paper and say, these are the people who funded my research. So once they're standardized and deposited with us, with their unique funder ID number, they're then again, it's back to tying up the data. So you've got the DOI and the funding body tied together. And we also ask you to send grant numbers if you have them. And this gives something that we've not had until now. So you've got a cross-publisher view of publications that have resulted 
from the grants of individual funders. This is our own funding data search website, which you can all take a look at. Here you can enter a funder name and it'll pull back all of the articles that cite that particular funder. Clearly this is a massive benefit, particularly to the funders who have probably struggled to um, check this across all of the publications, um, and particularly those who want to um, check that things are being published in accordance with any mandates that they might have about public access. But you, will, you can also look at the data in different ways, um, see other trends. If you go back to our main search page, you can put an ISSN in, um, and that, that will bring back all of the articles that have been deposited for that particular journal, and one of the filters is by funder. So uh, again, the text is probably too small, I apologize. Um, but for this particular journal, the, um, they're um, listed numerically according to the largest at the top. And this particular journal, the biggest funder of the research in their papers is the NIH and then the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So lots of things you can do with querying the data to find out things that could be of interest. From the funder's point of view, they can export this. Um, they get a whole load of information if they want to pull it out to a spreadsheet of um, the DOI, the author names, the article titles, the other funders, which is also kind of interesting because most of the articles that we see coming in, as you know, have got more than one funder. And again, back to the API, I'm gonna keep com coming back to this because um, at Crossroad we think it's really, really important because it's the main source of getting all this rich metadata that we have about your publications out there as effectively as possible. So you can come and query funding data through the API as well. Um, the most tedious screenshots in the world are API queries, um, but one is asking for how many articles have got funding data, the next one is how many have got funding data from the NSF, and then at that point you might want to say, well give me all the metadata for everything that's been funded by the NSF. And there's all kinds of things that if you were researching to this you could be doing with this information. That's the address if you want to go and play with the API. This is just a little infographic that shows where Crossref fits into it all. You've got the traditional funding cycle at the top there with results being reported back to the funder and then the additional loop of publishing the funded results. Um, Crossref in the corner there, if we get the funding data from the publishers, not only can we report it directly back to the funders, because um, obviously they're incredibly interested in that and we do that either via our search screens or through the API, but we can also provide that to anyone else who's interested. Um, and there are a number of third-party systems that are using this. One in particular is Chorus. I know everyone's familiar with Chorus in the room. It's a um, publisher and funder collaboration that's particularly looking at how, to, how publishers can meet the US federal agency mandates for public access in the states. But Chorus runs completely off the funding data in Crossref. That's powering that system. Um, so that's one example. They're probably one of the heaviest users of our API, but there are others. The share system also makes use of our API to pull funding data back. So we're just getting that out to wherever it's needed and wherever it can be made most use of. So a few numbers. Um, as I said, it's 11,000, 11,500 funders in our open funder registry, which has grown from 4,000 when we started. So we're not there yet. And I don't quite know where there is in terms of the number of funders that there are out there. Um, but we think it's pretty comprehensive. We've got about 650 DOIs that have funding data. And again, that's a teeny tiny fraction of the DOIs that we have. Um, so again, my call is if your organization is not extracting this funding data and depositing it with Crossref, please either consider it or start doing it because we really want that to grow. You can see how the data is gonna be really valuable to a lot of stakeholders. So to move on to my next question, um, after who contributed to it, is it original? I'm not going to talk about Crossref a lot today. Um, myself and my colleagues have been at meetings like this for quite a long time talking about it. Um, there are lots of details you can get into in it, but I think everyone's aware of what it is. Um, so I'll just give a quick update and an overview on that. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a piece of software from Authenticate that allows you to upload a manuscript and compare it against a huge corpus of content, um, including all of the content from most of the Crossref publishers. So just a few stats on it. We've actually got 700 publishers and societies using Crosscheck now, so it's really been quite widely used. And the database that you can check against has got 44 million um, items in it. That's journals, book chapters, conference proceedings. And there's a lot of content going through Crosscheck every month. It's about uh, just over a quarter of a million manuscripts are being screened through the Authenticate system for Crosscheck every single month. So that's, that's a fairly large amount. 
I had an interesting conversation a couple of weeks ago with one of our member publishers, um, quite a large publisher, who was showing some really preliminary data um, that over a two-year period they have been seeing, or they've been consistently checking incoming manuscripts. They've seen a trend where papers with very high similarity scores, there were, there were fewer of them coming in over time, but there were more papers with slightly lower similarity scores. And the similarity score, if you're not familiar with it, is the overall amount of text in a manuscript that matches other things. And as Irini's touched on and others, it's, it's an indicator. It's by no means a, a score of whether the, the piece has been plagiarized or is original. But anyway, this, this particular publisher is going back to look at this data in more detail um, and didn't want me to share any graphs or anything just now. But I thought that was quite interesting. And I wondered actually if anyone here has been using the reporting tools within Authenticate to do similar analysis. And if you have, whether you're seeing similar trends or opposite or whatever, but I'd be really interested to talk to anyone if, if that's the case. Oh, and this is just a little plug for a book that came out um, not very long ago. By, it's written by Helen Zhang, who runs some university journals at the University of Zhejiang, I think, in China. Um, Helen's also on our board at the moment, um, and she's been very involved in CrossCheck from the very beginning. Um, her journals were the first journals in China to use CrossCheck, and she's done an awful lot of research. She's a bit of an expert, particularly in um, plagiarism from non-English speaking authors. Anyway, this landed on my desk on Monday, I think, so I've only dipped in and out of it, but it looks like it's a really interesting read. There's lots of case studies um, and a lot of results from surveys that she, her and her team have done about um, attitudes towards plagiarism and, and various things. So just a little plug there. So the next question, has anything happened to this piece of content since it's been um, published? Obviously, the publisher's role is to curate the content after publication and follow up on the issues that we've heard all about this morning. And of course, you've all got various processes for doing this. You have always had the, the, the ways and means to do corrections and retractions. Um, but in the print world, you could probably be fairly sure that if someone read your journal, they'd browse through the next issue and see your correction notice for something that came out in the last one. Online, you've got a lot more people coming in from all kinds of places, landing on your article homepage, downloading the PDF that's of interest, and disappearing again. They may never come back to that landing page, or they may not come back for quite some time. So they've got their big list of PDFs stored on their iPad or on their hard drive. Um, how, how do they know that anything's happened? What if one of these things has happened to it? And this is, again, coming back to the metadata. By just depositing a small amount of extra metadata with Crossref, you can activate the Crossmark service, which some of you um, will be familiar with. I know there are some publishers in the room who use this. And this is all about alerting readers to significant changes to the content if they happen. So it's a logo that sits on your abstract pages and in your PDFs quite critically. And if you click on it, it pops a little box that looks like this. It looks the same across platforms, across publishers and journals. And most of the time, it'll just say, don't worry, the content's fine, it's current. Um, but if there is an issue, it'll pop up a warning box and say, actually, th there's a retraction for this. I think that's what that one says, the example says. It's particularly useful in that scenario. You've got a PDF, you're not on the publisher's site, you may have downloaded it weeks, possibly months ago, and you're going back to it now as you write up your work or do some further research. Um, clicking on the Crossmark logo in the PDF will pop the same box um, and will bring back the absolute latest information about that piece of content. So if there has been a correction or an update that the reader needs to know about, um, that's how they can find out about it. And a lot of it's about familiarity. As more and more publishers start to use this and the logo start to appear in more places, the hope is that readers are getting more familiar with knowing that that's where they can go to find out um, updates and also interesting information about um, the piece of content. Again, all of the Crossmark metadata that publishers send to us is available through our API. So with a very quick query, um, I can check and find that we've got 258,000 DOIs that have got Crossmark metadata. Of those, um, 25,000, 25,500 have corrections, and 890 are, are retractions, have been retracted. Um, again, all queries that anyone can make, if that's your area of interest, there's a lot of rich data in there for, um, and obviously all the other types of updates. I just pulled two as examples. And then there's a whole bunch of other data that you can put into um, the Crossmark record. Um, the example I gave in my list of questions at the start was, has it been peer reviewed? But there are two tabs in this box. The status tab tells you if there's anything happened to it. The second tab is the record tab. And that's open for any journal or publisher to put whatever they want in there, pretty much. Um, 
extra metadata outside of the traditional metadata that you send to us, extra metadata about, um, about the publication. So I've got a couple of examples here. Um, the one on the left is saying that it's been peer reviewed and in this case they're explaining they use a single blind peer review process. The one on the right, another publisher instead chooses to link to their aims and scope which contains their peer review statement. There are all kinds of things that can go in this box. These are some of the things that we're seeing most commonly, publication history, links out to data sets or supplementary material. Um, some people are noting whether it's been screened through the cross-check system. Um, pretty much, um, not endless possibilities, but a lot of possibilities here for extra metadata, extra background information for the reader that they can use to make sound judgments on the piece of content and also the publishing process it's been through. I dropped in two more examples um, just to show the different types of thing you can put here. The one on the right is showing that that, pe that piece of content has been submitted to the cross-check um, screening database. And on the left, they're sharing their license that's applicable if you want to do any text and data mining on that piece of content. Something that we've got in pilot at the moment that we're really quite excited about as an initiative um, that's taking advantage of the flexibility in the cross-mark metadata um, and that we also think is really going to contribute to um, research transparency. We are running a pilot where we're collecting clinical trial numbers that appear in papers and adding those to our own metadata. So as I'm sure you all know, clinical trials should be registered with the WHO um, approved registry and given a number. And then when papers are published that contain that number, if publishers pull that out and send it to us in the metadata, we can start to do the thing of tying things together again. Quite often there are more, there's more than one paper published about a particular trial. Um, I think I've listed here pre-results, post-results, through to systematic reviews and so on and so forth. And if we have the DOIs and CTA clinical trial numbers tied together in the crossref metadata, we can bring that all together. This is a mock-up. Um, it won't look quite like this, um, but it's roughly what we're thinking. So you've got a particular clinical trial, and actually all of these articles reference that trial. They're from different publishers, um, but they all in some way mention that particular trial. So now you've got a really good cross-publisher resource um, about as many things that we know about that have been published about that particular trial. So it's very much like the DOI system. This is something that you could do within a single publisher, and it would be okay, but actually the chances are that that trial's been published in journals from other places, and being central with Crossref, we can bring that all together. So as I said, this is in pilot at the moment. It's these organizations have been on the working group and working with us on it, led by um, Biomed Central. I think we're currently anticipating a review of the pilot in late January with a view to um, possibly launching at the end of Q1, possibly Q2, and having it, that information appear in that cross-mark dialogue box. Um, those dates are not quite set in stone, but that's kind of where we're aiming at. If you um, belong to another organization that's not listed here and you're interested in getting involved in the pilot, please come and find me because we're very open to expanding that group. So my final question um, in my opening slides was what can I do with this and that's a question that is answered by licensing um, li licenses or a single license that applies to the content and again we're asking publishers to start including these in their metadata deposits to Crossref if you do that we can expose them either in that Crossmark dialog box or through our API um, and you can deposit multiple licenses so you may have different licenses for different versions, or a good example is if you have an embargo period after which something becomes free, one license to start with, and then another one that has a start date for a year later, and that will trigger um, that one being the valid one. And again, the beauty of having all this in the Crossref API means that other systems, other people can come along and reference these things. Um, for example, funders might be very interested in this. If they are getting back all of that information about the papers that they have contributed to, they may want to also go off and check that the licensing terms are in accordance with their mandate for, for open access. So, I think I've probably talked rather fast and come around to the end, but my kind of call to action, if you like, rather than my summary, is that as publishers, this is all information you have. You've had it for a long time. Um, and we would really, really ask that you get it into your metadata so that we can help you to get it out there. 
it gives the reader a lot more information to make their own judgments on what it is they're looking at, as much background as they can get. Um, and it lets other people, and particularly other systems, use it either to research various trends, but also to build other tools and ultimately drive traffic back to your content. So please, as much metadata as you can send us is my message. Thank you. Well.